I'm Holly and my husband Ross died of brain cancer when my daughter Brooke was six and my daughter Texas was four. And this is my motherhood. Ross and I met on a job and um, we just hit it off straight away. There was just an instant friendship and attraction in a way that if somebody else had told this to me I'd have probably laughed. Just instantly it was I guess a whirlwind romance. There was this one day we were doing a job together somewhere in Liverpool and I started to get stomach pains. I was like what is up with me? And he said I've knocked you up haven't I? And I was like I mean, we should probably check that isn't the case. And so I took a pregnancy test. And so I went back to him and I just said, I think I might be pregnant. And he said, good age. <laughs> just as matter of fact as that, good age. And it was as simple as that. And he always made me feel that whatever was the outcome that we would just work it out together, that we would be, you know, we'd be in it together and ah uh, you know even saying that i i it's kind of it catches me because when we when we made that decision to not care and to be parents we we did it together and i didn't expect that i would be doing this on my own i just didn't expect that that would be the case i was actually filming some episodes of casualty when he uh, for the bbc and he started to get some really bad headaches and you know we dismissed it I was like telling him off being typical you know being the wife saying drink some more water like what's the matter with you and you know I'm looking up some of the symptoms he's having and yeah brain cancer was was one of them but you don't think brain cancer you don't think that that's going to be it he what on one of these days had a really bad head so we went to the hospital we were there all day and the two doctors came in and without pomp or ceremony just said, I'm sorry, Mr. Blair, but we found an egg-sized tumor in your brain. We'll look at the possibility of radio, chemo, brain surgery, but if there's nothing else we can do for you, we're just gonna keep you comfortable. And it was one of those moments where you, you feel like, your like your body is a dead weight like you're being sucked into the floor like you can't even process what's been said to you and i looked at ross and he just said okay what's next and what was next was radio chemotherapy radiotherapy brain surgery seizures hospital appointments we had ross then for three years and throughout all of that, we we really did live our lives. And yes, we had all the cancer stuff, but we lived our lives and we lived it really well. And we were happy, but he was very much, I'm dead or I'm alive. And I'm not gonna talk about cancer. I'm not gonna dwell on it. It is what it is. We went to Turks and Caicos. We had an amazing holiday together. On our return, he had a seizure. And from that seizure, he, didn't return from that moment. He just wasn't right. It was, you're dealing with somebody with a with a brain injury. The doctor just said, well, you know, do you understand? He actually said to me, do you understand the severity of what has happened, what is happening here? He's going to die. And I just, I wasn't ready for it. You know, I think <sighs> you, you can prep yourself in your mind but the reality is different. And to see him in that state and knowing him and knowing that he said to me, just kill me off if, if I get to that stage. And the doctor's looking at me and saying, we can, we can keep him like that for a bit longer. I just thought, what's the point? That's not, that's not alive. What you want me just to keep his body alive? Like in July, July the 29th, Ross died and he'd be in the hospice for a month and I'd been there every day and, and, and I hadn't been around the children. 
my daughter Brooke, the oldest daughter, she rang me and she said, Mom, I miss you so much. When can you come home? And I said, I don't know, darling. And she said, I really want you to come home, Mom. But I know that if you come home, that means Dad's died, doesn't it? And I said, yeah, darling. And so when I did come home to tell the girls, there was that moment of elation where they're like, mom's home. And then I had to say, you know, I could see their faces as their brain picked through it to realize that this meant that dad died. And just like the worst, the worst thing you have to say to your children. And it's taken, you know, it's taken a lot to to show up for them during your own grief. And from that moment, like I dealt with everything, I wanted to deal with it head on. As soon as he was gone, he was gone. Like there was no pretending for me. And sometimes you feel good, sometimes you feel sad. And we just have to honor how we all feel in that moment and walk through that moment. From something negative comes something positive and my daughters are extremely empathetic and understanding and kind. Yes, their, their model of the world now is that people can die and people that you love can die and that is not something I experienced at their age and oh, it's hard not to, to feel sad that they have to go through that. This kind of grieving of a parent at such young age, it's something that you will just revisit. And I will revisit at every milestone in their lives. You know, when they learn to ride their bike, that felt like Ross should have been there for that. When Brooke goes to secondary school, which is so like not long in the future, it's like, he should be here for that and he's not, and that's hard. So that's my motherhood. The Channel Mom Village is a space for you to share during the good times, the bad times, and the in-between times. And if you have your own personal journey of motherhood that you would like to share, then click the link below this and share it with the Channel Mom team.